All right, we are on the air with the uh, first official Hangout um, iMOOC with uh, myself and Katie Martin. And we actually have uh, Dave Burgess with us today. So he's going to talk for about 10 minutes. We're going we're gonna to ask him some questions. Uh, the format of this, since it's the first time, I'll just quickly explain this and, and what this actually looks like. Um, what we're going to actually do is we're going to talk to a guest for about 10 minutes, and then we are going to actually have um, some prompts. And we're gonna, we're gonna, Katie and I will go back and forth about, you know, things directly from the book for about three minutes each. And we're gonna set a timer for all this stuff so we know exactly, so we're not, this isn't a, a two hours of people just blabbing on about stuff. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like to welcome Katie Martin and uh, Dave Burgess. And so I don't know, Katie, if you wanna just say a little something. Hi, I'm happy to be here. It's been fun connecting with everybody so far on the hashtag and through Facebook. We are looking forward to connecting with everybody and continuing this learning journey and really digging into the book to deepen everyone's thinking. And then Dave, uh, if you could just do a little introduction of yourself. I know tons of people know who you are, but uh, we would love to uh, just have you introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Dave Burgess from San Diego, and uh, I was a teacher for 17 years, and now I'm a professional development speaker. Um, I'm the author of Teach Like a Pirate, co-author of P is for Pirate, and also uh, I run an educational publishing business with my wife, Shelly, which is Dave Burgess Consulting, Inc., which uh, we publish 20 different books right now, including this uh, pretty popular, powerful one called The Innovator's Mindset. Yeah, and, and that's actually... Uh we asked Dave because not only is he doing really amazing things, but we actually want to talk about his uh, his uh, business and, and what he's doing with the publishing industry because I think he's really um, you know turning things upside their head. But tell us tell us a little bit more about your like work in education. What did you do and and kind of how did actually teach like a pirate come around? Yeah, so I was a high school teacher, U.S. history teacher primarily, and a lot of people get kind of confused with the pirate thing. And so uh, this has nothing to do with the dictionary definition of a pirate. Like People get ca caught up on that sometimes. It's got everything to do with the spirit of a pirate. And if you think about the spirit of a pirate, the way I define it, it's very similar to an innovator's mindset because the spirit of a pirate is someone who's unconventional, someone who's willing to reject the status quo, someone who's willing to sail into uncharted waters with no guarantee of success, like a risk taker, a rebel, a maverick. And so it's embracing that spirit of being a pirate and that constant, that relentless pursuit for what engages and empowers our kids. And then once we find it, actually having the guts to do it and taking that risk and stepping out there and doing something new. And so that's that's kind of what the Teach Like a Pirate philosophy is about and embracing that kind of mightier purpose that, that we're life changers. That this, this isn't just about raising test scores. It's about raising human potential. And so uh, this is about something bigger. That's great. Dave, tell us a little bit about your as a teacher and how you really started developing this philosophy and how you started doing this work as a teacher yourself. Yeah, so uh, Teach Like a Pirate is, is in my ideas in the classroom are, are mainly drawn from outside of education and brought in. And so I, I think like we read too narrow in education, we look too narrow. And uh, I think like there's no other educational book actually that's referenced in Teach Like a Pirate. It's all stuff from outside. It's my background in marketing and entrepreneurship, my background uh, in uh, as, as a magician, my background as a coach, my background in uh, hip hop and rap music as an MC and all these things like brought in to, to develop the Teach Like a Pirate system, like how a marketer develops buzz, creates buzz for a new product. That's how I look at creating buzz for a lesson and a lesson plan. And so it's a, it's, it's a way of looking at the world and saying, how can I use that? What do other people use to engage groups of people? And how can I use that in my classroom? And you know, so I actually, um, my history, we, had, we would be crazy not to mention Shelly, your wife, who's absolutely amazing, one of the most, one of the most brilliant people I know as well. Um, and, and she does a lot of things that just totally blow my mind when I talk to her. But um, Dave and Shelly approached me uh, about publishing a book. And to be honest with you, I was approached by so many publishers and they were just so different. Can you tell us what kind of how you see the publishing business and, and actually are there any connections to what you see and, and what you're doing with publishing to education? Absolutely. So to me, the traditional publishing is, industry is um, it's based on an outdated model that is no longer reflective of, of how the world works and how people buy books and how books are spread. And um, so it was ripe for disruption. 
And I was so frustrated with the traditional publishing industry when I was trying to decide what to do with Teach Like a Pirate that basically, I mean, I ended up telling all the publishers where to go. And I formed my own publishing company with Shelly and we published Teach Like a Pirate right off our kitchen table, off a laptop. Um, because uh, the way, it's sort of like what she wrote about like blockbuster video in the, in, in the innovator's mindset where they're still trying to hawk these videos from a store when people can turn on the TV and get it off of Netflix. And that's the way the traditional publishing industry is. And so th their compensation models are outdated. They're based on a time when the publisher was the gatekeeper. In order to have your, your message spread and to get to a, a, a wide amount of people, you had to have them because they were the gatekeeper to you. But that's no longer the case with modern technology and social media. And so their compensation models are outdated. And the way that they market their books are, is outdated as well. When, see, our books are crushing the traditional published books. And, and the reason is, is because whenever people talk to me about the publishing industry from within the pub, publishing industry, they always want to talk to me about sales and marketing. Like, what are you guys doing to market your books? I don't understand how you're doing this. They want to talk about sales and marketing. We want to talk about spreading messages. We want to talk about building communities. And we want to build about, talk about servicing those communities. And when you, when you build a community around your message, when you service and you're an authentic member of that community and you're building relationships within that community, then that's what eventually sells books. It's like an amazing thing about the universe. If you go out and you try to sell books, you don't sell any. Right, because that feels that there's something icky about that. And not only does it feel bad for you, because you're always feeling like you're giving a sales pitch, but it feels bad for the person on the other end of that as well. But if instead you go out and try to spread your message because you think your message is powerful and you build relationships and communities, then all of a sudden the, the wonderful thing about the universe is that you also happen to sell books by doing that. And that's, that's absolutely amazing to think how that parallels so much about education and, and why we do what we do. So I know Katie's got a question for you. I was just thinking, I know, Dave, you've really pushed the manifesto. We don't want to write a, you know, a textbook. We really want to focus on a manifesto and really th write things people are passionate about. And you have sold a lot of books and you have impacted a lot of people. So talk a little bit about how your books and how your views are really helping to shift school culture and what you think needs to happen um, in our school systems to really do what's best for kids. Yeah, so I think that people get really frustrated because uh, they want change to happen all at once and they want everybody to jump on board all at once. And, and that's just not the way that, that you shift culture of, of a school or a system. And like it changes is something that you can announce from the podium. You don't get up and say like, hey, we're all going to be pirates now. Here's your eye patch or wh whatever it might be, right? And that, that's not the way you do it. The change is built from a grassroots level, which is why I'm so excited about this MOOC, the I am MOOC, because this is a, it's a grassroots thing. And like I look at change, at cultural changes, building a snowball. And if you wanted to build a giant snowball and you went out and you tried to grab up all the snow at once, well, it would all crumble away from you and you would get nothing, right? That's not the way you build a snowball. You get a little bit in your hand and you work with it and you shape it and, and, and you, you pack it tight, right? And then you add a little bit more to that. And then pretty soon it gets big enough where you can put it on the ground and you can start to roll. Well, that's the same way you shift culture at a school, is that it, it's, it, you get a few people that are enthusiastic about the message. You don't waste your negative, the energy on the negativity. You work with the people that do want to change, that do want to shift, and you work with them, and you work tight, and you build it tight, and pretty soon the energy and, and that radiates out from that group, and other people say, hey, I want to be a part of that. Like, what is that that you have going on over there? And, and then you can add them in. And then pretty soon it gets big enough, it has enough momentum where you can set it on the ground and roll it out and change the whole system. But too many people get frustrated at the people that won't change rather than working with the people that will. And so Dave, we got about two minutes left, so this is gonna be the last question for you. And I think it really ties in nicely to what we're trying to do with uh, I am uh, the Innovator's Mindset MOOC. Um, how do you really kind of, like people are so hesitant to share their message. People are so hesitant um, because they're worried like, oh, I'm gonna look like I'm narcissistic and it's all about me. And we're really trying to get people to actually not just read the book, but share their stories as well. And I know that obviously, just from what you're saying, you're very passionate about that. How do you get people you know, to feel more comfortable when they share that story? Yeah, so this is a conversation I have with people all the time, including uh, most of our authors, is that they feel, well, I, I feel uncomfortable sharing what I'm doing because like, other people are gonna look at that and think like I'm showing off or I'm being egotistical. And, and here's the thing. If what you're doing is powerful, if what you're doing could help other people, 
you don't, it's just not, it's not just okay for you to share it. You have a moral imperative to share. It. If what you know in the, in the journey that you're on can help other people, you have a moral imperative to share it. You don't just have a moral imperative to share it. You have, you have the imperative to, to get good at sharing it, in fact. And like, I think about you, George, and like, if you would not have become a prolific sharer through, through your blog, through building a large social media platform, and if you would not have put the work in to become a powerful speaker and to create and, and hone a message that resonates in front of an audience, then you would not have been able to amplify your, imp your impact like you have. It's because you were willing to step out there and become that powerful speaker, and because you were willing to create that social media platform and share what you were doing in your journey and to connect with other people, that you've had such a big impact in education and the innovator's mindset has had a big impact. And so uh, it, people, people have to learn how to get over, you have to get over yourself because what you're doing is so amazing you need to make sure other people know about it. And Dave, I really appreciate that. And thank you for so much for your kind words. And I actually, one of the things that I'm very adamant about is uh, not only using my platform and my um, audience that I have access to, which is absolutely phenomenal to just share my message, but to share the message of other people like Katie, who sitting there and listening to her talk, um, her and I connected um, when I was doing some work at the University of San Diego and I'm saying you have to block like you have to start sharing your message so I find that once you start sharing your message it becomes very important for you to empower others to do the same so um, I know I really want to thank you for your time Dave is on the road and he you know found a, a place to connect with us I know Katie will you know probably thank you as well I just want to echo that but also um, something you said I think really stood out that it's sharing your message is a moral imperative and sharing your hard work, but it also is hard work and really taking the time to um, get good at your craft is a process. And so people are not good at it from the very beginning and it takes time. And I know you and George have both put in the time to really craft your message and really do a good job of sharing your hard work, but also sharing that of others. So thank you so much for really amplifying the messages of so many great educators. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me on. And I'm so excited to see this just absolutely take off. And I can't wait to, to watch all the learning and to be a part of it and to see how this is going to have a huge impact. So thanks so much for putting this all together. Thank you, my friend. We look forward to connecting with you. Keep, keep doing what you do, man. All right. Safe travels. <laughs> So Katie and I are going to take over now. We're going to actually, um, we're going to do a little bit of a chat and we're going to share, um, we're going to take elements of the book. So we're going to go about three minutes for each one. But what we're actually going to do is we're going to take a little element of the book. We're going to go three minutes. Uh, this actually was an idea based on the TV show, Pardon the Interruption. It's my favorite sports show ever, where they just quickly go through topics as opposed to um, just kind of going different, you know, just kind of going everywhere. Um, so we're going to kind of just go for three minutes of topic and just kind of share some thoughts and we hope that it will inspire you with some ideas. So the, the first one, um, there's a video shown in the book and it's, it's based on a, or discussed in a book, it's about Blockbuster and just kind of how relevant it's become and how it's become this living studio, which is crazy because um, this is something that only their last store, actually like franchise store, closed about, um, you know, I think two, three or four years ago. So how do we see, and I just wanted to ask Katie, like, how do you actually see um, something like Uber or Netflix? Do you see anything like that in education? Do you see that there's this time where we're, we should worry about this big disruption in education where we become, you know, essentially the, the blockbuster of education? I think there's a few examples. One that really comes to mind is this notion of competency-based education, thinking about um, different pathways for people that move us um, beyond the traditional moving everyone at the same pace at the same time, thinking about different pathways, thinking about um, smaller credentials or opportunities for people to learn. But I really see um, the competency-based education as Blockbuster is in kind of very, it parallels it very much because if we don't think about a new, if we keep adding on these new layers and new models, but we still keep our buildings intact and we still keep doing things the same way, we are going to just keep adding on layers and miss out on opportunities to really shift education to really meet the needs of learners in the classrooms and prepare them for the world they need to be beyond school. And, and you actually see, like, you see, like, a lot of classrooms, a lot of people are focusing on, like, um, 
when you go into school, what I find is surprising, some of the best environments, they don't look like school anymore. They look more like Starbucks. They, their learning environments are a lot different, but they're really trying to empower people. And, and one of the things that I think I've really shifted from and I think is really important um, is, is moving away from the idea of saying our, our, our most gifted students to our most academically gifted and understanding there is intelligence in all of our students in some different capacities in a school becoming that place where we're looking for this because when kids, you know, kids are so empowered in their learning before they even walk into school and then, you know, we're making them do things sometimes they hate and there's going to be other options. And I think that if we don't kind of rethink the way that we're doing things, you know, what will we look back at 10 years from now and go, oh my God, why were we doing that? Yeah. I always think of that in the sense of current level achievement rather than your academic or your aptitude because kids are performing in a way they have achieved at a certain level based on the experiences they've had. And if we're only honoring certain things and not certain skill sets, we're missing out on the strengths of so many different learners. And so the, the next prompt, uh, there is a, a really powerful video. It's by a, a young, young person named Dan Brown, and he talks about um, what education looked like. And one of the quotes he said really resonated with me. He says, the world is changing. If you don't change with it, the world will decide it doesn't need you anymore. And what are, what are you seeing as some of the shifts that are happening outside of education and how are they actually imp impacting uh, what we're doing in schools, what we're doing um, you know, in education, how do you see them actually impacting learning? Um, so I see there's, I mean, obviously companies and are saying that the skills they need, the skills they need for kids to be successful in the future. But I think that if we don't change how kids are learning right now, we have schools that are not, um, kids that are not developing the mindsets they need to be successful. We're having, we're seeing different people create different models. We're seeing parents are opting out of schools because they're not, they're not meeting their kids' needs. So if we don't change, we're going to keep seeing people move and create different opportunities. And one of the things that I've actually noticed um, just traveling around in the last little while, um, when you hear people say, oh, we need to prepare kids for the real world, I find it really interesting that the real world has YouTube and social media and all these other elements. And so that's a, then we say, oh, we don't want that because we need to protect them. Like, we don't want them in these spaces and, you know, we don't want them actually sharing these things. And, and, and so, you know, it's, we tend to use the real world arguments when it's beneficial to, you know, maintaining something that we've done uh, in education. And, and I, I do remember this one kid, um, I was actually connecting with him and he was building a car in school. And he was using this high end like engineering program. The kid was like, I think 13 or 14 years old. And I went up to him and I said, like, how did you learn how to do that? And he, and he just looked at me and said, YouTube. Like I was the stupidest person ever. And I thought it was really fascinating to actually see this kid, you know, and then, and then schools block this, right? And, and schools, you know, uh, take this out and they, they use, you know, but then on the other hand, they'll use the real world argument. I find that really fascinating. And do you see that at all, Katie? I see that all the time. And those contradictions, you walk into schools that are one-to-one -one and they're giving access to all their kids, yet they have signs all over the place, cell phones away, that you can't use your cell phones or that they're blocking access to YouTube. They're blocking access to all these resources so kids aren't actually interacting with the real world. They have a device and they might be doing some activities on a computer, but they're not actually doing things that are preparing them or even having them interact beyond their classroom still. So I think that's a challenge, obviously. And so the, the next prompt from the book, uh, one of the quotes, and I think a lot of people have resonated with it, is the notion of change is an opportunity to do something amazing. And um, when we look at change, a lot of us are very reluctant to it. And, and one of the stories I've been talking about lately is if you have um, someone who's moving from grade two to grade three, and one's a kid and one's a teacher, it's usually the kid who's excited and the teacher who's reluctant. Like a lot of times when we're younger, you know, when we're kids, I think that we're more um, open to the change because we see the power in this. And so I think um, this is something that we're really trying to get people to embrace through this book is the idea of how change is really 
a great, you know, a great thing. And, and it's something that we need to embrace. It doesn't mean that every single aspect of things that we see in our world today, um, we should just totally jump on. Like you didn't, you don't need to make sure that all kids are using Snapchat in your classrooms because Snapchat is cool. Or you don't need to like make your school like Pokemon go or anything like that. But how are you actually seeing, you know, when you look at people embracing change or you see, you know, that notion of change in school, um, how do you see this beneficial that, you know, when people start to actually embrace change and what their, what their work is? There's so many opportunities. I mean, when things change, you have to do something different. And so it provides us opportunities to step out of our comfort zone. One of my um, good friends and a principal here locally in San Diego his school was closing, they were closing the school and they had to turn it into a magnet school. And so it was an opportunity to change, but they could have done the same old thing and just relabeled the school, but they really took the opportunity. It's um, Vista Innovation and Design Academy. And they took the opportunity to rebrand and really focus on what they wanted for kids. And the entire staff stayed on campus except one teacher, but they have completely changed the culture, how they interact with kids, how they interact with parents, because they took that opportunity to really rethink and focus on what they wanted to do better for kids. And it just, it's a, it really embodies that change as an opportunity to do something amazing. There's, there's actually, it's, it's interesting because there's a, there's a school that I know that just started and it, it's brand new. And what I found fascinating is they don't actually have a photocopier. And when I tell that story to audiences, they freak out like, oh my God, what would you do with it? But, the, but a lot of times we're so comfortable with what we've always known, but if you just started teaching and there was no photocopy there and every kid had a device, it's not something that you'd see as crucial. And I, I think that was really a, a fascinating uh, thing to me is that sometimes we're so used to what has always gone on in school is that when we are disrupted by that, it does freak, you know, freak people out. Now, one of the things that, I, that Katie and I are both really adamant about is the notion that, like, we're, I don't think either of us are like, oh, we need to totally blow up school and it's horrible and there's all these bad things. Um, we see a, a lot of amazing things and Katie just gave a really good example of this. And so Katie, what are some of the like really transformational things? Like what are some of the things that you're seeing in education right now or even schools, teachers, classrooms that, you know, maybe would inspire other people, would inspire people to actually try to do something different and actually connect the way. What, what do you see as like really transformational and ultimately better for kids? So many things. I think you're right. We, I get the great fortune of seeing so many great educators and really working with people at all levels of the system who are doing amazing things. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention, you know, one example, my husband started a soap company in his, in his class. So he's not only teaching chemistry, but his kids have had to figure out how to start a company and design products. They're using the chemistry to create soap and create other products. They have to figure out how to sell. They have to figure out how to work with customer service. They have to problem solve. So it's, there's opportunities and there's a lot of other educators that are doing it. And they're really bringing in the entrepreneurial skills into high schools so that kids are really getting a taste of how to interact with people so that they're ready when they leave school. And they're ready to do it now. I mean, there's kids doing it all over the place. So that's one example um, that I've seen. I actually saw, um, I know Bridget Visser. I'm pretty sure she's uh, listening in on the show. I was actually at uh, one of her schools and one of the students there, I was, I was talking to the kid and he is like really into basketball. And what I found fascinating is he actually invented a spray for the bottom of your shoe so that your shoe would have a better grip when you're on the court, right? And so he actually saw this problem um, that, that was happening with something he was very passionate about and he actually, you know, created that solution. We'll talk about that notion of problem finders later on. Um, you know, uh, introduced by you and Macintosh later on. Um, but it is kind of fascinating to watch some of these kids, you know, some, some of the, the, the classrooms that are really rethinking um, how to give kids these opportunities that don't exist. And, and one of the things that I'm very adamant about is that a lot of kids, when they look at things like social media, they feel they're held to a higher standard and that some of it's unfair because they can't get away with some of the things that, to be honest with you, I got away with when I was younger. Um, you know, just being a kid because they feel their lights under a microscope. And one of the things I always say to them is that, you know what, I totally understand. This is absolutely unfair. 
But that being said, you have opportunities that I did not have when I was a kid. So you need to, which one are you going to actually focus on? I think um, that's something that um, we really are trying to actually emphasize um, in this work. And so the last prop we're going to talk about, Katie, and, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this because obviously, you know, I, my thoughts are very clear um, if you read the book. Do you believe that every educator could be an innovator? And if so, what does that look like? I do, and I really think that they have to be. Um, but I also think that we don't give teachers enough credit, and I think the great majority of teachers already are. They just don't know it, and they're not labeling themselves as such. I mean, if you think about the kids that come into our schools every day, every kid is so unique and so different, and teachers automatically work with kids who are individuals and are trying to find new and better ways of teaching and reaching kids. So I think that the nature of the profession has to be innovative and is always evolving. Um, you know, and there are some who are struggling and, and, and keep doing things the way that they've always done them. But I think the great majority of teachers really are um, rethinking and, and trying to do better for the kids in their classes and trying to figure out how to serve them in a way that meets the needs of the world we live in today. And, and I think that's when you, when a lot of people, when they hear it, like they kind of are dismissive of that term. When they think of the word innovator, they're like thinking teacher that's like a robot builder and, and making drones and all these other things, which is like they're, they're a lot of times associated, associating it with, you know, doing all these amazing things with technology, doing all of these, you know, crazy different elements. And like, um, I, it's Susan uh, Spellman, and I hope I say her last name right, Kane. Susan Spellman Kane. Um, she's actually starting. Um, uh, she she does a lot of work talking about the the notion of counseling um, and innovation, and and it's just how you actually look at the people you serve and how you actually work backwards from there. And I think you know, as you're saying, it, this is not. It is kind of understanding the kids that are in front of you and here's something that's not innovative to me is that you have to say you have you teach the same grade level year after year after year and when the new kids come in the syllabus is the same you know when you're going to teach a certain element you know what time of year and the thing is is that if you don't even actually understand the kids you're serving you you do limit yourself in innovation is that some of these kids will know different you know will have you know more strengths and it's really how do you think about what's best for kids and not kids as you know in general, but you know, serving kids as individuals. Absolutely. And I think just to echo your point, George, the fact that so many people think to be innovative, I have to use technology and I have to have all this flashy stuff in my classroom. I've had too many people say to me, we have to really focus on the basics. So we can't, you know, we've, we focused too much on innovation this year. And I think that the two, and I know you share the same view, they, they don't have to be separate. And doing what's best for kids doesn't have to be about flashy technology. A lot of times it's connected to that, but it's really about the learners and helping them um, do, do bigger and better things. Well, and that, I think that's a really crucial component because a lot of people will actually talk about, you know, what about the basics? And we're like saying the basics are crucial, but if you, if you are taking an English class and you're focused on the basics, you know, and they don't, you know, the, the bar is low. But if you're wanting kids to actually become writers, they're going to learn the basics. They have to learn this, but it's so much deeper um, th than, you know, simply, you know, simply teaching the basics. The basics are not enough in our world today. They're a good foundation, but we have to go beyond. I think that's a really crucial element. And so for the last about six minutes or so, um, we have some questions that people have given to us that they want to ask, to ask on the show. And so um, I'm going to actually, uh, the first one we're looking at is from Rick Gavin in Brampton, Ontario. His Twitter handle is at Rick Gavin, G-A-V-I-N-3. Um, and he actually talked about um, being at a new elementary school or principal. Um, and, he, and he talks about, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing here, you know, as he's moving into new staff, what is something that he should, you know, as a new principal, what is something that he should, you know, maybe change or look to change immediately. And so do you have any thoughts on that, Katie? Yeah, and I'm gonna steal one of my favorite quotes of yours. Um, thinking about innovation, thinking what's best for kids, it doesn't have to be looking at the technology as we were just talking about, but looking at moving people from their point A to their point B. So I think the first thing is, it might they might not be in the same place that his previous school was, most likely not, but look at where they are and look at where their strengths lie and really, I think the fo if you focus on learning and you focus on 
how we can provide better learning opportunities for kids and for teachers, you'll see opportunities for innovation. You'll see opportunities to do better, and you'll really allow for the learners to highlight those needs. And then I think the best leaders build off of those and take people where they want to go. And, and one, of the, one of the suggestions I give is that if you're a new administrator, the first thing you do is not change anything. You actually get to know the people. And this is a very, like, uh, a suggestion I give to people all the time is that walk into the school, have a spreadsheet, put every staff member's name on that spreadsheet, and then beside them write strength. And then until you can identify the strength of each person and they know you know that strength, don't move anything ahead. Because if you work where people are really strong and move from there, as opposed to focusing, you know, on their weaknesses, uh, we tend to lose quite a bit. And a lot of people think that you're there to change them, that they're not good enough. And uh, as opposed to they're really amazing, you're trying to make them better. And I think that's a really important aspect is don't just go from the place of uh, where you're walking in looking to change, you know, things right away, but actually you know, looking to know the people you serve and building on what they're really amazing at. I think that when they know their value, they'll go a lot further. Um, the next person is uh, Shannon Sieber. Her Twitter handle is at Sieber Shan. So S-I-E-B-E-R-S-H-A-N. And she is from Round Rock ISD in Austin, Texas. And so she asks, how do you convince administrators who put innovation on the back burner for logistics and procedures and why is innovation, like, why innovation is so important in school? So how do you actually work, you know, a lot of, and it's funny because I hear a lot of teachers saying, oh, my God, my principals are holding us back. And then you hear a lot of principals, oh, my God, our teachers are holding back. But how do you actually kind of lead up? What, what are some strategies you see for teachers, you know, to help convince, you know, the people that are maybe their bosses to actually, you know, help them move forward? Great question. Uh, I think that a lot of times people need to see what you're talking about, they need to see models because we throw a lot of words around in education and we talk about transformation and we're gonna do everything differently, but it's hard for people to see what that actually looks like and it can be overwhelming. So I think showing people models, getting into different classrooms, even if it's videos, but providing access to what could happen and what opportunities exist for learners, but then also going back to what is it that the kids in your community need? And I think if we always go back to the kids in the community and, and really empathizing with them as learners, asking kids, getting their input, it's hard not to move forward. It's hard not to really see that there are, there are things we need to do to better serve them. And I think that when you, when you look at the stuff, when we look at when you work with administrators, there's a question I keep asking over and over again in the book, is, is the question, what is best for this child or what is best for this learner? And I think that part of it is that sometimes in education, we tend to jump the gun and we're really excited about certain things and we want to try them, but we don't really think about the implication to kids. It's maybe something we're excited about, but we don't know if our students will do this. So I think that when you're working with, with administrators and you're a teacher, one of the conversations that I always start with when I'm trying to convince someone above me to work with is say, hey, you know, you and I are here to do what's best for kids, right? And I'm waiting for their confirmation that that's what we're, we're here to do. And then actually, when they confirm, I have to show how what I'm asking is going to be ultimately best for kids. And at the end of that, you know, conversation, if I can do that, you know, in a powerful way, there's no way they can actually really say no, because we're both in accordance. And if I've proven that, but there is that question, I think that is a really great conversation starter. But knowing that, can you prove that in what you're asking for? And so the last question I'll take um, is from Isabel Martin. She is from, actually from, oh my God, Spain, Mal Malaga? I have no idea. Malaga, Spain. Yeah. Um, and she's, ask she's asking how did you put these things into practice? How do you actually do this? And this is similar to a question I got from Andrea. Um, her, her, and she's from New Jersey at Art Tech Andrea. And when you're looking at this, a lot of people, we're not trying to necessarily change everything you do. But I think it's about changing one thing you do, really looking at some practice and how can you ultimately make it better? Because when you change that one practice and you see the success of it, ultimately it usually leads to something else and it leads to something new. You, you start building off those successes, um, you know, being able to iterate and doing these things. Now, when I work with a lot of people that I talk to, I never focus on um, 
I never focus on the idea that, you know, you you have to do everything that I'm talking about plus this. I'm trying to get people to think you have to you have to replace something from what you've done before. Um, and I think that's a really important aspect. It's 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 finding where you make this priority, but you're looking at something and you're saying, well, instead of doing this, I should do this instead. And not only will it be better long term, um, it'll actually, you know, be not only better for the kids, it'll be better for my practice. So any suggestions for people just getting started looking at how to innovate in their classrooms, Katie? Absolutely. And I think based on what you're saying, doing something differently, one of the examples is lesson planning. Teachers are taught to lesson plan, we're expected to lesson plan, plan. But I planning for this perfect lesson that doesn't happen so an example of being innovative you could actually do less I find when we when I work with teachers and we're helping them think about using resources that exist and designing really powerful experiences for learners look at how you can put less structure in place and really provide clear learning targets but helping students find their resources and connect with each other and reach out to people beyond the classroom, that sometimes takes some of the cognitive load off of the teacher from doing all the planning and putting on students, but it empowers them and creates much better learning opportunities in the long run. So sometimes we think of all this that we have to do, everything we're doing and more, when I think if we look at it differently, there's a lot of things we could actually take off our plates traditionally that inhibit the learning process in the end. And I think that's a way to end with Katie. To end with Katie. That idea yeah, that basically you're actually doing that at the end. I don't know if I'm getting a little feedback. Yeah, feedback, feedback. Um, um, but connecting in that way, I think, is really, really crucial. And a lot of times it's not necessarily only about um, taking the work and giving it to the students. It's actually sometimes we're taking away the learning from our kids and not letting them do that. I think that's a really important aspect. I always give this example of, you know, instead of you spending hours trying to find the best probability video, why not actually ask kids to go find one and put it into like a Google form and actually, not only are you teaching them the concept of probability, they're learning curation skills, critical thinking, and you're spending less time doing this, right? Because these are real world skills. These are skills, how do kids find information, how do they know it's relevant? It, and it's going beyond simply teaching the notion of probability. Um, so we, uh, Katie and I'd like to thank you for your time. We wanted to keep this really fast paced, kind of jump around some ideas. I uh, really appreciate all the people that are tweeting, sharing their ideas. Um, we would also love any feedback on the formatting of this show, what you think of it, um, what it actually looks like, um, how would you like to do it in the future. Um, this is actually, well, should be automatically posted uh, to the most recent blog post on iMOOC. And what we're going to do every week is um, we're going to announce our guests on Tuesday. Some people you have known because they're, you know, you know, all over the world education and we want to introduce you to some people that you might not know so we're going to try to find that balance to because we, we know that every person out there can make us better educators and we want to tap in and, and learn from them as well uh, and then thursday katie will actually um, write a blog post and highlight some of your blog posts because it is about you sharing and we want to give you a bigger platform and then uh, either friday or saturday we'll do this again but we'll announce when that's happening so i really want to thank you for your time katie do you have any final words I just want to say keep blogging, keep sharing. I was reading through the hashtag today and so many new bloggers have jumped in and really embraced their fear. And I have been already learning so much reading about your experiences and I look forward to more and more of them as we continue through this MOOC. So thank you for already jumping in and um, just being so excited about your own learning process. And thank you for watching. We look forward to keeping up with the tweets, seeing you um, and sharing. Oh, and one last thing. Um, this week, I'm gonna challenge you, and I did one, uh, to do a Twitter video reflection. Actually, post a video because we thought it was so powerful to actually see selfies of you to actually connect. So just do a video reflection on uh, the introduction. So we're just gonna focus on the introduction this week. So if you could read that, that'd be great. And, and let's keep those conversations going. Thanks for joining us tonight. We look forward to connecting with you more.